Welcome back to the Million Dollar Tipping Point podcast. Today, we have a great guest on our show. It's Tasha Booth. Before we get into that, I do want to say you can find me at Virtually Curie on Instagram, and please let us know what you think about these episodes. Let us know which guests you like. Let us know which guests you want on the show, and I will always try my best to do that for whoever requests them. So, Tasha Booth is an agency owner, coach, and podcaster. She is the founder and CEO of The Launch Guild, a full-service launch support agency working with established coaches and course creators with course and podcast launches. Her team is over 20 members strong and works together to support their clients in being able to focus back into their zone of genius. Additionally, she mentors virtual support pros, launch managers, and agency owners who are passionate and ready to grow their businesses while living life on their own terms. And she is the host of the How She Did It, How She Did That podcast, a podcast for virtual support pros to learn business and tech tips. So you also actually, Tasha, from my research, first of all, welcome. I'm already diving in. Look at me. Um, oh, thank you. <laughs> from my research, you also have Love Your Launch podcast, right? Yes. Yeah. We do have two podcasts. We, we did that kind of as a series. And so we haven't added to it in a while, but it's got a lot of great launch tips in it. So definitely. <laughs> oh my goodness. I, so again, I was looking through all your stuff. We kind of talked about this offline and I don't understand how you have time for all this, <laughs> or you're just really like really good at having this so automated and so systemized and being such a good manager that everything is like, you know, you've dotted your I's and crossed your T's and everything is bulletproof and super like, you know. Yeah. It's, I think it's a little of both. First of all, my team is amazing. They're all rock stars and I couldn't do a quarter of what I do without them. So I think that that has kind of been the key for me. Um, I talk about this a lot. I have adult ADHD and it is crazy sometimes. And so I am definitely not the cross your T's dot your I kind of person um, in general, but my team really helps me out with like the things that I don't do. <laughs> Tell me a little bit about when you got into being a business owner, because it's usually, this is not mm -hmm. always the case. Usually people don't go to school for it, right? They don't, right. or they don't go to college or they're not in high school. Like I am going to be an entrepreneur. <laughs> yeah. So how did you start out and talk, walk me through the growth? Yeah. So my degree is in musical theater. So I definitely did <gasps> not go. <laughs> oh my gosh. I love musical theater. This is just me, my life. And do you it, sing too? I do like sing. Me? Yes. Okay. What's your favorite musical? I, I don't almost don't want to derail this because I have a bad habit of doing that, uh -huh. but, but what is your favorite musical? Favorite musical. That's a hard one. It kind of changes sometimes. Ragtime is one of my favorite musicals. Oh. So ragtime. Uh, I've done Aida three times. And so that's a favorite of mine as well. Um, I'm actually uh, in rehearsal right now. I'm playing Esmeralda in Hunchback of Notre Dame this summer. So. Oh, cool. Oh, yeah. that is, I, I do not do that stuff anymore with like two kids. Like, so yeah. I was doing a little bit before. Mm -hmm. um, I definitely did in high school, college I auditioned, but I don't anymore. Yeah. <laughs> too much, too much going on. I know there's so much going on, but I was really happy after the pandemic of like getting back to, to live theater and getting to sing again and dance again. Yeah. I missed it. <laughs> oh man. When we log off, I want to know more. Okay. So musical theater major, keep going. So yeah. I, my degree is in musical theater. I did that professionally for years. And then I decided I wanted to get a more stable job that paid me more. Um, so of course the decision that I made was to go into the nonprofit sector, which made absolutely no, no sense. I, I, I I'm drowning over here. Like okay, I know. you need to get paid more and you go to nonprofit. Okay. I got a nonprofit, <laughs> right? So I was the health and well-being director for two YMCAs, loved what I was doing, hated the paycheck. And so I started off as a VA to earn more extra money to pay off my student loans, to pay off some credit card debt. And it kind of really snowballed really quickly. Um, and I got to the point of where I quit my full-time job within four, I gave them notice within four months of wow. starting my business. And then I stayed on for another like four months because they um, had a hard time finding somebody to replace me. So I stayed on for another like eight months total. Um, yeah. And it just snowballed really quickly. And then I kind of got into the place where I was doing a lot of tech VA support for my clients. And a lot of them were course creators and coaches and they needed all of the things. And I didn't want to offer all of the things. I didn't want to be their designer and their copywriter and mm. their launch strategist and their project manager. I wanted to be their tech VA because tech is the thing that I love. Um, so I finally decided like, okay, what if I 
like just created this like amazing team that could do all the things that could be the experts that worked together day in and day out and had a system and communication styles that work together to, you know, support our clients. So yeah, that's kind of how the Launch Guild was born. And I think overall in terms of growth, it's just been kind of year after year doing a, not doing necessarily a little bit more, but like the momentum building a little bit more in terms of people knowing us and, um, you know, staying visible and all those things. I see on your pages, which is like super impressive to me that everywhere you turn it makes me want to buy something, which I feel like has to contribute to your success, right? Mm -hmm. Like you have Tasha Booth where it seems like you're doing some coaching almost, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. um, so you're training VAs, PA, PMs, and OBMs. Um, for those people who don't know what that is, that's a virtual assistant, project manager, and online business manager. Mm -hmm. And they specialize in launch management. So with this program, it only opens a few times a year, right? Mm -hmm. Correct. And how many people do you take on for that? Usually we have anywhere between like 11 to 25 ish is usually our cohort sizes. And is it for a full year or just? Few no. So this one, so launch manager certification is three months. So mm -hmm. we usually do like three cohorts a year of that program. Okay. Mm hmm and then you've got the um, service provider who wants to turn into an agency who wants to grow basically like how you were a VA and then you're a tech VA. And then you're like, I'm going to create a team, so right. you create an agency that I saw was a 12 month program. Mm -hmm. It's a very small group. How many people generally in that group? So we have 60 people right now in there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then I like that you had like conditions. You have to apply. I, I mean, everything seems like you have to apply. Mm -hmm. When looking through exactly, I love that. I think that's a yeah. very cool marketing technique mm -hmm. that it creates this like, oh, I need to be approved. I need yeah. to, and it, it makes people serious. I think about it, right? I agree. It's it's the I want people who are serious. I want people who are dedicated. I don't micromanage people, so I want to know that like they're dedicated to getting to the end result and to showing up and being there. And I also want people how, who have enough experience that they're going to get the promised transformation. And so if it's like, if the person's a brand new VA and they've never done a launch before, launch manager certification isn't for them yet because they don't have the experience, like just knowing what a launch actually is, you know, or knowing what a open rate is. I need them to know those, those, that terminology before they're ready for the program. Same thing with agencies. I get a lot of people actually who are just like, well, do I have to start as like a solopreneur? Can I just go straight to like owning an agency? And I'm like, no, you need the experience of knowing, first of all, your validated product and your validated off, you know, what your offers are. But second of all, understanding like what it takes to get to the end result. Like how long does, does the thing take, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think that, 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 um, those are the two main reasons why, yeah, applications for everything. For our audience, can you go into a little bit of what a launch consists of? I know it's mm -hmm. going to be hard to like really distill it down, but yeah. try your best so that they can understand. It. Let's say I am writing a book and I want to launch it in the fall. Okay. We're yeah. recording this in June. <laughs> so I want to launch it in September. Just yeah. Tell our audience a little bit what that would look yeah. like. Yeah, we actually don't do book launches because we don't do product <laughs> launches, but. <laughs> okay. okay, my bad. All right, pick another example. Okay, so let's say you wanted to launch a program in the fall. Okay. So we normally work with our clients for about eight weeks. And the goal within that eight weeks is to get them ready for about a, a week to 10 days tops of there really just being a lot of energy around whatever their program or thing is. So um, I think people think that launches have to include all these bells and whistles and like fireworks and everything. A launch is really at its most simple, really letting your audience, your core audience and bringing in more audience people to understand who you are, what you do, who you serve, how they can work with you and putting a spotlight on one specific product service program for seven to 10 days. And I guess my, let me get even more nitty gritty. Mm -hmm. What does that look like? Like yeah. so when I, I want people to understand, like, you know, there's emails that have to be crafted, right? There are, there's a social media game plan. Usually, mm -hmm. um, 
just kind of break that, those down. Yeah. So it starts with a strategy, right? So we like to start all of our clients off with like a really clear strategy. We talk to them about like, what are some ideas that you've had? What, what are you thinking about doing? How do you already enjoy showing up? How does your audience already see you or, or know where to follow you? So once we get that down, then it's a matter of, okay, what is that customer journey like from the beginning um, of the launch. So usually something like a webinar or a challenge or a summit or something mm. like that, where they can just get a little bit more of that person for a while. And then it leads into, of course, the offer, the actual offer and an invite to join the course or program or community. So yes, um, we always have supporting things like emails that go out to remind people that the launch is actually happening. We have social media that goes out, sometimes Facebook ads that are happening at the same time. It's just a matter of really figuring out what our clients want to do and how they enjoy showing up. We talk about stress-free launches all the time, which like blows people's minds because they're like, launches have to be stressful. I know. <laughs> and I'm like, well, there's the good stress and the bad stress, right? The good stress is you care about it, right? There's the energy, the excitement around it, but that bad stress comes when we're not prepared for it. And we're not, we're, we haven't done the work on the front end to reap the rewards that we're looking for during the actual launch. So the goal in the launch guild and for our team is to really support our clients and making sure that like, they're not writing emails at 11 o'clock at night, the night before, and that they've got all their ducks in a row so that they really can show up as their full self and show up in their zone of genius during their launch. That it's a lot for our audience members who have never really done a launch. Um, and sometimes service providers fall into this where it's like more consistent stuff they do month after month. It's a lot. It's it can be very work. stressful. So hearing mm -hmm. like stress-free, I'm like, uh, I don't know how that's possible, <laughs> but sure. <laughs> um, so, so that's kind of like, I guess what you're doing with the launch guild, right? You have the mm -hmm. full service launch support. You've got day packages where you have a launch day, design day or strategy day. And then you also have a podcast launch pro mm -hmm. um, project, um, product, I should say. Um, and what's amazing to me is like, how do you actually kind of split this up? Cause you must split up your year somehow. So you don't get overwhelmed. Right. So you've got the VAPM and OBMs learning launch management three mm -hmm. times a year. Right. You've yeah. got the service provider turning into an agency program. That's 12 months. So that runs a whole year. Mm -hmm. And then you've got, you know, launch guild day packages, podcast launches. Talk to me a little bit about splitting up the year so you can have time off if you take time off. Some people mm -hmm. don't, but you know, is <laughs> it so that you can relax so you can do your musicals, right? So yeah. Much back, yeah. Stuff like that. Yeah. So I am huge on prioritizing rest, not just for me, but also for my team. So we actually take two full weeks off twice a year. Um, actually one of them is coming up. So we take Juneteenth through the 4th of July off and it's a totally complete off where like if people email us, we are not there. Our clients that are launching, that we, we never have clients that are launching over our break, but if we have clients that are like during that, you know, eight weeks, we actually extend it to 10 weeks so that we can take that full break. And they know that if they email us or Voxer us or Slack message us, nobody's answering for a full two weeks. And you're pretty strict um, about that. You're like, guys, you can absolutely. Yeah. Okay. I, yeah, I, I tell my team, we start talking about this at least a month out that like you cannot answer because what I don't want is to not show kind of a united front. And I want everybody to take actual time off. And then we do the same thing uh, the last two weeks of December. Um, in addition to that, everybody on my team, uh, all of my full-time employees have unlimited pay time off. So for example, my, um, my assistant, Danny is actually in Australia for a month and she's working half days oh, wow. <laughs> while Very she's cool. in Australia. Yeah. So it's, it's things like that. And we definitely prioritize rest. Um, the, the reason that I can do so much is because over the years, we have worked really hard on the agency side to get me out of the day-to-day -day implementation. So I still do sales calls. I still do proposals. Once the person has said yes, that's it. That's, that's the rest of you know, their, their day-to-day -day contact with me. I may send an email and check in and everything, but I trust my team and I know that they are experts at what they do. And they're also experts at supporting our clients with amazing customer service. So once they've said yes, like I'm, I'm out of the implementation part of it completely. So then how, I mean, but those are for launches. So then you must mm -hmm. though be working with the, um, training, the VAs and, PMs right. and, and also the surface provider turned into an agency. So does that take more of your time then? 
that takes probably more of my time. I also do have a support team on that side in terms of accountability coaches within agency Thrive Mine. Um, I would say launch manager certification probably takes the most of my time because that's a program that I run by myself now. But even that is really like we've been running that. I think we're on our fifth cohort. So almost two years we've been running that program and we've got it down to, you know, automated I, I know what, when the Q and A is going to be, when the lives are going to be, I know when capstone is going to be. So we just, we do a really good job also at setting our calendar at the end of the year for the following year. So all of my breaks and all of my busy times are already accounted for. This is very organized. That's what I was getting to. Like this, I mean, you're like, no, I have adult ADHD, but no, this is organized. So props to your team. Thank but, you. So I do kind of want to talk about your team. Um, who or what was the first position you hired? Mm -hmm. So a long, long time ago, when I first started, the first, first position that I hired was actually a Pinterest manager um, oh. because I was doing a lot of Pinterest management and I was just overwhelmed. So it was a person to double me and to take some of those Pinterest management clients. If I were to do it again, I would not hire a Pinterest manager as my first person. <laughs> so what I teach and what I really live by now is that an operations manager or an operations assistant at least would have been my first hire. Reason being for that is because the thing that I see agency owners, especially spinning their wheels on so often is like, I know I should be creating these SOPs. And once I have the processes down and have them templatized, then I can hand it off, but I don't have time to hand it off because I don't have the SOP, you know, so it's this revolving door cycle. kind of, it's a circle, right? Mm. It's a cycle. And so find, having that operations assistant to be able to create those SOPs for you. Yes, you're going to have to create a video or something, you know, to get them started, but to create those processes for you and also to get to know your business when it's smaller so that as you're growing your team, as you're growing your client base and everything, they know your business from the inside out because they've been there the longest and they can support you in managing the team and onboarding new team members. Same thing with clients. So then Talk me through how your team grew and any mistakes maybe you made as you grew other than the Pinterest manager, but like, <laughs> yeah. you know, one person's different from a whole team now. Yeah. It sounds like you have full-time employees, which I do. is yeah. amazing. That's great. So like there had to have been at some point where you're like, okay, I can't have a contractor for this anymore. I need mm -hmm. someone completely devoted to my team and what I'm building. I kind of yeah. want to hear more about the growth and I'm sure a lot of our listeners also want to hear about that, that growth with hiring. Yeah. So the first full-time uh, person I hired was my director of operations and she was with our team for about four years. And I got to a place where there was a pivot point where I knew that like I needed her undivided attention and I didn't want to wait in line as one of her many clients anymore. Um, and she was working, I think she was doing already between like 20 and 25 hours a week. So it was close, close enough to full time that it made sense. And there was still enough that like, oh, I can fully full fill, you know, a 40, 40 hour week for you. Um, so that was the first person that I, I, I hired full time. And I really think that what, what I tell people is that when you are realizing number one, you've got consistency in what you can give those, that person or those people. Number two, you have consistent cash flow. It's not like a huge fluctuation, you know, month to month. And then number three, it's that like, oh, I really need this person's time and I don't want to stand in line anymore. There's that, that kind of jealousy thing, you know, coming creeping in, but in a good way. Um, and then once we really had both sides of the business running so well and frankly making a lot of money at that point, that was when I was like, I really need full-time people who are just more full-time people who are just really dedicated to supporting both sides of the business as we grew. So that's when we hired our first full-time project manager, marketing manager, um, my executive assistant, um, and social media manager. Those were the, the positions that we hired first full-time. And were they remote to begin with, or did you have an office mm -hmm. like pre-pandemic? Okay. Yeah. Everybody has always been remote. So my team, I hire only in the U S um, because first of all, because it's easier for like taxes and accounting and all that stuff, but then also just because of time zones and everything, we, we work with clients all over the country, but we communicate so much that even having people that are East coast and Pacific, that's hard enough, <laughs> but yeah, so I couldn't imagine having any more time zones. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, that would be a lot. 
So talk to me a little bit about um, competitors and how you've placed yourself compared to other um, businesses that might do something similar. Mm -hmm. You know what? I think I don't worry about competitors. Like I, I worry about, am I showing up as my best self? I worry about like, how can we support and serve our clients better and in, in bigger ways and what do they need? Um, I think comparison, I see a lot of comparison itis in the online space and it never seems to serve the person that is comparing themselves to somebody else. Um, and so I think I learned this probably from musical theater. Like, you know, you can, you can go in and sing the same song, just like another person. And for whatever reason, somebody picks them over you, you know? And so Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it can often be a matter of there's nothing that you can do other than being the best version of who you are and bringing the best to the table for the people who love and support you. I want to rewind a little bit. Mm -hmm. Um, you said that, you know, when you're building out your team, I don't think I actually got like a full understanding of how long it took you to get to a place where you felt like you were making good money, making good amount of money. Right. Like you, Mm -hmm. you kind of mentioned that. So we said like, okay, it took you eight months when you were working the nonprofit. And then by the time you're able to be a VA completely, but then how long did it take really to get from like the tech VA? Oh, I want a team. And then to really get to that point where you're, you know, I am comfortable and I feel really good about this money. Mm -hmm. I would say within the last two years has been where I'm like, I make really awesome money and it feels really good. (laughs) Um, I have always prioritized my own paycheck um, and made sure that I've always paid myself consistently and always paid myself well based off of what we're bringing in, mostly because I'm a person who really values that and being able, like it would, it would feel like for me, I feel like it would feel like, well, what am I doing this for? If I wasn't paying myself consistently, like I would just be much less motivated. Um, and so, yeah, definitely. I've always prioritized paying myself well. Okay. Mm -hmm. I agree. I have two. (laughs) I mean, (laughs) if that means I need to like reevaluate where I am, then I will do that. But I always think I just remember once when I was like starting my business online, I was on some forum and someone was like, the biggest mistake I ever made was not paying myself what I should have done. And that stuck with me. And that was like, oh my God, that was like seven years ago. And I remember thinking, you you know, you read so much online advice and that just stuck in my head for whatever Mm -hmm. reason. And I, no, I totally agree. Talk to me a little bit about, um, when a client or customer was unhappy Mm -hmm. and how, or maybe you're having one right now. How do you <laughs> minimize the unhappy clients? Because I think something that separates, you know, seven figure business owners from others is the fact that they somehow figured out, and I was talking to another guest about this. She was talking about how she reiterates things a million times, like for mm-hmm. her programs, you know, she reiterates something in an email and a social media post in like a form that they have to fill out. You have to realize this is going to take you like 12 hours or something like that, you know, yeah. over and over again, because that will minimize it. Um, so tell me a little bit about what was a point that you had an unhappy client or customer and then how did you rectify it? Yeah, I think that point about like saying it and reiterating it in multiple places, I start a conversation about communication, about expectations, about what we need from our clients from the very beginning, from the discovery call. We talk about it again in their kickoff call. It's in their welcome packet. It's in their contract, you know? So it's definitely layered and reiterated in a lot of places. And we're really big on like managing expectations on both sides. Um, I also think it's a matter of we, I really value our clients having a strong relationship with their primary point of contact, who is most of the time their project manager. And so when our clients know that if they have an issue or if they have something that doesn't feel right, they need to communicate and talk to their project manager first before they think to come to me or our operations Mm. manager or any of those people, because it's important to me that they correct or communicate clearly and directly with their primary point of contact so that they can have a a better relationship with them first. There have been 
I will say few and far between, there's been a handful of times where, you know, a project manager, maybe and a client haven't been a great fit personality wise or for whatever reason. And I've had, I have had to step in. And when I do that, I always start with an internal team meeting. And I ask this question, I say, okay, what is ours to own? And what is the client's to own? Because we, we've all heard the, you know, adage, like there are three sides to every story. And that's, that's the fact. So if we can be really honest in like, are we not like, did we not explain this well? Are we not showing up with integrity in what we said we were going to do? Like, what should we own? Like, let's be honest about that. And once we understand what is ours not to own, what is the client just being crazy or like, you know, whatever, whatever the case may be, then it does a couple things. It puts like, okay, the things that are ours to own, how do we change them? How do we rectify and improve the situation? And the things that aren't ours to own, we need to take the emotion out of that and like figure out a solution that doesn't involve emotion. Because what I don't want are my team members to be walking around feeling awful about these things that they're, they're not responsible for, you know? So I've always asked that question when we've had a hard client conversation or a hard client or you know, a couple of times clients that we've just been like, this is not a good fit. You're going to get a partial refund. Enjoy the rest of your life. <laughs> <laughs> How do you weed them out now? I mean, you must've gotten better. I'm assuming over the years of weeding out clients that, yeah. and this can be even like the, like maybe VA, VAs in your program mm-hmm. or the service providers, anything like that. How do you get to the point where you're like, I know now what to look for? Yeah, I think it's a matter of asking enough questions and asking super clear questions. So some of the questions on both in both our discovery calls, as well as in our applications for my programs come out of, you know, bad situations come out of like, I've had this situation, I don't want to repeat it again. So now I'm asking this question in a way Mm. that doesn't feel negative, but like gives me a, you know, gives me the red flag or the green flag, depending. Um, So I will say on the agency side, what we found was that the pattern was that our least happy clients were those who really weren't ready for the type of launch support that we provide. You know, they, they hadn't launched before, or they had really small lists, or they didn't realize that like how important it was for them to fully show up on social media and be emailing their list and doing the things that are required for them to have the results that they want to have. And so on the backside of that, even though like we say everywhere, we're not responsible for like the revenue outcomes, you know, that you may or may not have, they're looking for somebody to blame when they don't get the, you know, the, whatever the they thought the yeah. outcomes. Thank you. Yeah. The outcomes. So we just realized that like people who have done the work, who already have an established program who already have established students and clients and an established base of people who want to buy their product. We call those like level two and three launchers and now level zero or level one launchers. They're just not our people for a variety of reasons, but that's the main, main one. So I think things like that, figuring out like who, who do you best serve and who are those clients that you're like, oh my gosh, I would work with them 70 more times if they let me, you know? And you'll start seeing the commonalities in that. And you'll start also seeing the commonalities in like, oh, if they paid me $70,000, I would not do that again. (laughs) What do you consider an established, you know, audience Mm -hmm. or established base? Yeah, I would say somebody who has absolutely at least done one launch for whatever they are trying to sell. Um, So that means they've had one successful launch. They could have done it on their own and maybe they've had 15, 20, 25 people, but it's a validated offer, a validated service or product. And they're now ready to kind of start scaling that, that offer and that product. They also um, have an established business overall. So they're not, it's not a new business that, that has a new offer. And they also have some kind of presence. So they're emailing their list they're doing social media, they're creating and cultivating that community in at least one really clear and key and consistent, consistent is the word in that consistent Mm. way that would be established for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What do you think are some common pushbacks that people might give you? Mm -hmm. Um, I definitely think, well, there's two of them. I was going to say price point, but honestly, we don't get as much pushback on price point anymore. The thing is, we are very conservative about good, better, best numbers when we're telling people like, here's what you can potentially project 
for the number of people or the dollar amount that you could make in this launch. And we do that based off of email list. And so if the person doesn't have a large email list, those numbers are not going to be super fun for them <laughs> to see no. in black and white. <laughs> so, you know, we have people come to us and they're like, I want to have a million dollar launch. And I'm like, okay, you have a thousand people on your list <laughs> and good, better, better, best is one to 2%. So <laughs> It's That's, like, you're not Tim Ferriss. Yeah, Sorry. exactly. So <laughs> how about we start with something more realistic? And sometimes people like love and appreciate that. And they want to go forward because they know that the foundation that they're setting now with all of the things that we're going to support them in is going to help them get to that million dollar, um, you know, launch eventually, mm -hmm. but it's probably not going to be this launch. Uh, and sometimes people are just like, nope, you're crazy. I know I can do it. And I'm like, I cannot wait to get that email when you do do it, but we are not going to be the team to help you oh, because no. I'm not going to be, you're not going to be mad at me in eight weeks when you don't make a million dollars. So you must've been, um, at one point you must've taken on some kind of client that it bombed. Oh, I don't yeah. have any other better words for Yeah, where the launch Yeah. Bombed. Yeah. And it, it happens. And I think that what's really important to us is that we're not just looking at revenue. Like there are so many other metrics that are, I would say equally as important in a launch so that, you know, what to continue doing, what to stop doing, what to, you know, start mm. doing for the future. So if you are only, that's why we have an entire launch debrief with our clients. Once we finish the launch, we're looking at what was the engagement like? What were the questions that kept popping up for people? You know, like what were your open rates like? What, when did people respond the most to mm. an email or to a social media post? All of those are keys in terms of like, how can we maximize and kind of optimize everything for future launches? So that brings me to a very important question I have. It's kind uh -huh. of like about revenue. You know, you're, you're operating a big business, so well, pretty big business. You're not Microsoft, but you know, almost, <laughs> um, how do you balance like how, getting the revenue and also spending money? Because when you have a business this size, you have to also spend money. And I know there might be times when months or weeks you're in the red mm -hmm. and then sometimes you're in the green. What is that like for you? Um, first question, I guess is let's talk about what is the best investment you can make. Hmm. I think. The best investment you can make is in your people, because if you have amazing people who are there not to just support you, but also really care about your clients and your business as like a growth vehicle, everything else, it becomes infinitely easier. Um, and everything else doesn't feel like this huge push of a boulder uphill. So I have always prioritized, um, you know, paying people well and prioritize having the right people in the right seats to the point of where sometimes my CFO has been like, so your, your team costs are like really high. And I'm like, they're doing a great job and I can't mm -hmm. do this without them. So my team costs are just always going to be high and I will cut other things before I cut, cut my team costs. And when you have a good team, I mean, imagine well, everyone's been there when they've, they've worked with someone who's not good and who mm -hmm. they've hired someone who's not that great. And then it's like the amount of time and energy it takes to stay on top of them and make sure that they're doing things correctly and training them and retraining them and retraining. Like, yeah. It's not yeah. worth it. Why do that? Why wouldn't you rather pay a higher price? And not it's totally worry? not worth it. And like, I am not the person to do that. Like I said before, I'm not a micromanager. And so I will, and I can't hold it in my brain. Like I just know myself and know that like it, something's going to fall through the cracks because I'm not going to be able to remember to follow up with them mm. to make sure that they did the thing. So I need people who are autonomous enough to follow up with themselves to make sure that they did the thing. Um, so yeah, I would much rather pay for that. So then let's talk about the other question, which is when you've got, when you're in the red sometimes. Mm -hmm what does that do to you mentally? How do you mentally work with that? And then also strategically. So I guess like mindset as well, like, cause I'm sure as some of my audience are growing their business, it's hard to let go of like always being in the green, maybe yeah. and seeing the oh, yeah. sometimes. Yeah. I think, so I always compare my business to Starbucks because Starbucks is my best friend. <laughs> <laughs> I drink a lot of it. And anytime anything 
you know, good, positive or negative. Usually like I use it as an example for a negative when something is happening, when I'm having a down month, I'm like, you know what? Starbucks is huge. They make like billions of dollars a year. And I guarantee you there are months where the CEO is like, dude, what is happening with revenue? Like, what are we, you know, what is going on? And so if that's happening with Starbucks, of course, it's going to happen with like my little baby business. Mm -hmm. So thinking in terms of it's just business, it's up and down months are what happens in business. Have I always had that mindset? Absolutely not. It's definitely been something that I've needed to work on. It's also helped that I track all of our incoming revenue pretty much ad nauseum. So like right now I can tell you what our projected revenue is for June of 2023, like right now, like what we have on the books for for next year. And the reason for that is because I love the challenge of being like, ah, you know, three months from now, we are losing a bunch of, you know, clients uh, in one of our programs or one of our programs is ending. And so we're losing those payments or something. I have three months to figure out how to make $30,000. Like, what am I going to do about that? Like, I love that challenge. Mm. Um, So I think for me, putting it, putting that sort of a spin to it of like, how can I, how can I show up for myself and for my team and just get this done, make it work? Have you ever had a complete year where you've been in the red? I have not. I've okay. not had a complete year. <laughs> I have That's definitely. So I def- <laughs> yes, I, I have not had a complete year. We've definitely had months where we've been in the red. Um, July, July of every year is a really hard year for us. And so I think for the first few years of that, it was like, oh, everything's going to crap, you know, when it, when it came around. But now seeing like the pattern of like, oh, July just is not a great month for us, right? And understanding that, but September, like uh, end of August, early September, fantastic months for us. So understanding what the patterns are and what the data is showing you makes it less about you as a person or like doing the right thing or not doing the right thing. And more about like, these are just the numbers and this is the pattern. Do you think it's like the fall because, you know, like back to school and people Mm -hmm. are just like, I feel like fall is a bizarre reinvention time for a lot of people. Like, oh yeah. I'm going to get this done. I'm going to do it. like that. in like January, right. It's yeah. mm-hmm. those two. I notice a lot of like, um, like in my business too, it, it's a lot of like, Oh, you know what? Now I've decided I need this because it's fall and I'm reinventing myself and my business. And it's like, okay, but yeah, yeah. It's a lot, I don't see much. Yeah, totally. It's, um, fall and spring are, are two big times for launches for us because also like there's not as many huge holidays, especially like September mm. through mid October. So it's right. a great time for people to get in their launches before all of the crazy holidays happen. So like December's tumbleweeds for us too, which is why we take two weeks off and we're like, no one will care. No one will notice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Everyone's taking their time off. <laughs> yeah. Um, so what advice do you have for other women as they grow their business? Um, why do some women hit roadblocks and others don't? What, what can they watch out for as they grow? Mm-hmm. I feel like everybody hits roadblocks. It's a matter of what you do when you hit that roadblock. So for some people, they hit that roadblock and then they sit, just sit down in the road and they stay there. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's a matter of, okay, I've hit this roadblock. Well, what are my options to how to get through or around it? Um, I think that something that has been, or a few things that have been really important for me and to me, I've always had some form of coaching, whether it be, I'm in a group coaching program, I'm doing one-on-one coaching. I just think that an outsider's perspective into what's happening in my business is so vitally important. And then the second thing is to be around other business owners. Um, This is one of the reasons why I stopped coaching agency owners one-on-one and went to a group program model because the difference in mindset that I saw was when agency owners had an issue, either they had an upset client or a team member didn't work out or team member up and quit. They'd be like, this is the worst thing that's ever happened to me. You know, And I'm like, other agency owners have gotten through it. Like you will Mm. be fine. And they wouldn't believe me because they've, they're in their silo and they're, it's just them. Whereas in a group program, somebody will bring that same thing to the Facebook group and 10 other people are like, oh, that happened to me last Tuesday. Here's what I did about it. You know? So they realize, oh, I'm not doing anything wrong. Like this doesn't make me a bad business owner. Like this is just, it's just business, right? This is how, how businesses work. Um, So definitely having your group of people that you know, that you trust, that you can be really honest with 
in your journey and that understand the online business space, um, that understand kind of the things that you're going through. I think that that's really important. And then the last thing I'll say is consistency. People ask me all the time, like, Tasha, what's your, you know, secret sauce? What, what makes you special? And I'm like, nothing makes me special other than the fact that like, I kept going when others stopped. Um, and when, and I'm big on rest. So it wasn't like I hustled and grinded my way. Like I take naps every single day, <laughs> uh, every single day I take a nap, uh, sometimes too, <laughs> but I, I paced myself and I stayed consistent the entire time. That's great advice. I don't think I've heard that one before that mm -hmm. someone takes two naps a day. <laughs> <What Yeah. happened? laughs> Take it out. I love it. You know, you know, it works for you. And I, yeah. and I think I've learned that too. Sometimes when I get sick, I look back and say, what have I done? What have mm -hmm. I, I've been going too hard, especially if it's like a random sickness, right? Uh, have you faced any hurdles as a woman in business? Um, mm -hmm. and also as a woman of color in business? Yeah, I would say, I think the hardest thing for me has been realizing that because I am a woman of color in business, there will be people out there who don't necessarily think that I can help them. <laughs> um, I think the flip side of that is there are so many amazing black women who have come to me and said like, I chose you to be my coach because I've never seen anybody else who looks like me doing what you're doing. And so that is the blessing in it. But I think the downside of it is that sometimes people make, and I don't, I don't think that they're making this decision from like a conscious place. I think a lot of times, like we have implicit biases that just have been kind of ingrained in us, but like, they'll see a picture of me on a Facebook ad and make a decision that I'm not the coach for them specifically because I don't look like them sometimes. Mm. And that, that was a hard pill to swallow that like, it's not a thing. It's, I can do literally nothing about it. It's just, and this is what it is kind of thing. But once I realized it's just, is what I, what it is, it's a matter of loving those who love me and embracing those who embrace me and supporting those who support me and realizing that there's somebody for everybody and I'm not the person for everybody. Mm. <laughs> All right. Can you tell us where we can find you? Um, and we'll totally list it in the show notes as well online. And if you have any freebies that you want to share, I know you do because I saw yeah. them, but, <laughs> but please, please, this is your moment to just tell us where our audience can find you. Absolutely. So I have two websites because I have basically two sides to my business. So the launch is where you can find me for all things, full service launch support. And then TashaBooth.com is where you can find me to support if you're looking to become a certified launch manager or to start, grow, or scale your agency. Um, both of those have multiple freebies on them. So on the Launch Guild side, we have one that kind of lays out the beginning of your project plan and how you kind of set your project plan up for success. And then on the Tasha Booth side, depending on whether you are interested in growing your agency, I've got a little 15-minute masterclass video training um, on that side. And then also for launch managers, um, I've got a couple, but one, the one that I like the most is on tracking metrics, because that's something that a lot of virtual support pros feel not as confident in when they first mm. get started in supporting their clients with their launches. Oh, that's great. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. What is one philosophy mantra or quote that you try to run your business by? So my mom, from the beginning of time, from the time I was a baby book, baby girl, <laughs> has always said to me, keep your feet on the ground and your eyes on the cross. And I think that like, even if, you know, you can replace cross with whatever is meaningful to you. Um, but I think like for her, it's always been important that I remember where I came from. And I remember my purpose, my bigger purpose in life. And so, yeah, that's, that's the one that I use. I like that too. Oh, so <laughs> much good stuff. Thank you so much for being on this podcast and sharing your journey and sharing advice and tips for women. I think that they might not get anywhere else or, you know, and it's, it kind of goes back to what you're saying too, with being a woman of color and like, so people can relate to you and understand mm -hmm. how you did it as well, which I think is so important for bringing awareness for everyone, yeah. every woman. So thank you again. I really appreciate it for our listeners. Everything's in the show notes and we'd love for you to subscribe or share the podcast. And we hope to keep in touch with you, Tasha. Thank you. Thank you.